Hello there, thank you for purchasing another Kenny Roy lecture. You obviously are about to see the Advanced Character Animation Workflow Lecture. I like to introduce this lecture in the, in, in the following way. This w workflow is the thing that I like to focus on the most. I think that if students and professionals like are not really focused and concentrating on workflow, what you're going to get is you're, you're, you're going to get stagnant results. Okay, you're going to stagnate. You're going to get frustration in seeing those results um, stagnating. Okay, and what you're going to you, you, we're going to have is, is is kind of always this little bit of guesswork every single time you start a shot. So, in order to remove the guesswork and to make predictable results, you need to start thinking of the way you work being the most important thing to think about when you're working, especially while you're learning. And that's something that I, I, I think is a big eye-opener, uh, especially in my classes at Animation Mentor, what is kind of a rude awakening to my new new students is is we're going to be talking mostly about the way you're working and and not what you're doing the results will for the most part speak for themselves and that's not to say that what you're what you're producing shouldn't be great it should, it should always be great but if you can't remember how you got there then what's the point if you can't do it again then who cares so when I start talking about advanced character animation workflow, where we start with the advanced is, is beginning with concepts of, of a working practice that you never would do. And, and I mean this is no insult to anybody who's watching this, but in, in five and a half years of the Animation Mentor and about 650, 700 students um, mentored so far, of my own personally, I, I just know. This is not something that uh, is an intuitive process. It's so, so tempting to just surge ahead with the work. So that is what we're going to be talking about, is, is beginning to start to triage your workflow and processes and, and really get down to hopefully the meat of your problems and, and start solving them. This is not, however, a, oh, well, this is a trick that's going to, that's going to change your work forever. Well, there's a couple in there, but um, anyone looking for a quick fix is uh, is going to be disappointed because there's there really are no quick fixes. There's only hard work between you starting being an animator and uh, becoming the best you can possibly be. Okay, I always I always say that it's it's always better to work smarter and not harder, and uh, that's really true for workflow. So why improve workflow? Obviously, knowing how you work is the first step to improving your work. If you take every shot willy-nilly, you surge ahead work, working, you put your head down and you charge forward into every single shot, it's admirable, and I see it a lot. I see it very often, actually, with animation students. You're not going to be able to improve your work thoughtfully and, and actively. It's almost going to be a passive process. I'll talk about the passive process in a second. Um, you're going to do faster work. And the more you apply your workflow, and the more you work on your workflow, it's almost like a turbocharge. It accelerates your acceleration, so to speak. You're going to have better work. And isn't that what we're going for? Now, there's an old adage in, uh, I think it's almost all uh, the uh, uh, vocations, all manufacturing, all businesses, where you can have good, fast, and cheap. Right? So, do you want fast and cheap? No, well, then it's not good. Do you want uh, good and cheap? No, well, then it's not fast. You have to wait around forever. If you are good and fast, or fast and good, then you don't have to be cheap. 
Their, their uh, animation can be a really, really good profession that pays well. Less changes. This is what I was talking about with the frustration. If you are predictive with your workflow, then you can make it in such a way, your scenes I'm talking about, so that changes are not so destructive to what you're trying to do. And more fun. This is, this is the most important. You want to have fun. I mean, we're making cartoons, people. What could be better than that? So I, I, I want you to have more fun, and, and this is how you're going to be able to do that. So let's talk, let's go to the very beginning of your workflow. So most of you, I, I, most of you are animation mentor students. This is the majority of my customers so far. Uh, even if you weren't an, an AM student, you probably were taught planning tools and were told which ones y you should do and and basically, you know, pick and choose which one of these planning tools you want to um, you want to work with. I want to talk just a little bit about these because they have their own purposes in production that you may you may not realize, and maybe now knowing this fact. It'll change what you think and how you feel about these planning tools. Thumbnails, I'm going to talk about a little bit more uh, later, but thumbnails are probably the most underused planning tool that there is. I am a huge fan of thumbnails. I ta I'm talking in a second all about thumbnails. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll definitely cover that one. X sheets. Now, the cool thing about an X sheet or a dope sheet is that normally you're provided these if you are provided these by a by the end client or by a supervising production or something of the something of the sort so for instance my company did a pilot for Nickelodeon and we were provided all the x sheets for all of the scenes. The neat thing about that was that the animation went super, super fast because you had basically all of the timing timed out by like a master animator who had a really good sense of timing and and storytelling and and basically it was almost like painting by numbers, but but animating by numbers. So it was a really incredible experience to have that much already started for us. The cool thing about X Sheets is that it gives you a lot. So I'm not necessarily saying that you want to make an X Sheet for your animation, but what I am saying is that if you are on a production and there are X Sheets floating around, you definitely want to get your hands on those because it is, if you, if you start using them, it is kind of a way where you can get an insight into some, uh, a, a really professional animator with, like I said, that sense of timing and storytelling. You kind of have them working over your shoulder, which is a nice thing. Now, of course, you can't always get these kinds of planning tools, and it'll be up to the production. But I really liked how Nickelodeon provided these to us. So um, these aren't dead, is all I'm saying. These are still around. And especially, um, we did some work at my studio for uh, uh, American Dad, and they also provide those. Storyboards are probably the least, um, I would say, informational or information charged planning tool. Storyboards are more directorial, they're more composition. It's very hard to show good movement and if there is a pose it's, it's not normally the most animation kind of driven pose. It's not normally the most expressive full body body language kind of gestural pose. It's normally the like that money frame from that shot directorially speaking. This person running down an alley, then it's probably, you know, the the foot, you know, in frame, like 
boom or something or maybe they're halfway down the alley and they're they're you know the the classic comic book character running away from you pose where the where you're looking like right down the leg and they're running away or something like that so in terms of planning tools yes storyboards are important but we need to move on in terms of where we get our, our information out of. I want to caution you about video reference in terms of getting in information. If you've watched the cartoony lecture, you understand that video reference can be very dangerous to a cartoony workflow. In terms of your, your advanced workflow, in terms of dialogue tests and uh, etc., video reference can be amazing. But I want to tell you how I would use video reference in order to um, make a scene work. Um, I know it, you feel like the, 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 that it, you're not getting as much information as you should out of video reference if you don't like hit play on the um, on the dialogue track and lip sync it. But that is so limiting to your 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 body, your brain, and and just the process of doing it over and over and over and over to try to match the timing of that is going to sort of trick you and steer you away from performance choices that might be much better for the shot that you're 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 about to do so i see i see animators using video reference in a really limiting way in fact, I, I feel like you are almost better off not using it the way that I see so many animators use video reference. So what I would do with video reference is set up a camera and learn the line and then perform the line over and over and over and over in front of the camera, you speaking it, not listening to the, to the word, and give yourself the time to soak up the character and to get involved in the character and to develop the backstory and to take on the yoke of, of the subtext of the scene. Get everything very comfortable and once you're there, come up with the performance choice that if you had all the time in the world, then you would, you, you, you would um, use that in your animation. Okay, so if the line is, you know, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. You know, that's a pretty quick, pretty quick line, right? Um, when you're performing it, don't constrain yourself to that time limit. If you feel like a, a full body gesture between uh, my dear and I don't give a damn is, would be the strongest performance choice, you know, maybe something like this. I'm just making this up. This is, you know, extremely cliche, and, and it's not, it's not, it's not really the, the best choice. I'm just making a point. But if you felt like that was the best um, performance choice for that moment, then when you're performing it, do it, and then, and 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 then when you have that performance choice, then your your challenge is, oh, how do I get this performance choice to fit back into this this dialogue? How do I how do I make this scene work now? That's a much better challenge to have than to have been working over and over and over and over and over and limiting yourself than you know you know you know the other way. So, <clears throat> frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Maybe that's what you wanted to do. Now that was a very weird gesture I just did, but again, it's for the point that there's you don't have that time in the dialogue. But if you have a very strong pose choice, a very strong gesture that you want to get in there, then it's a great challenge for you. And it's a really strong characteristic of a good animator is that they were not. They, they were not limited, and they did find a way to get the strongest performance choice into the scene. Okay, so, so video reference, I see it being used way too, way too literally. Uh, I see this all the time. Play, they run out, and then 
just wag your wag your jaw while the person is 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 whatever. And do you see my 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 horrible low performance there? I see a whole lot of that. So you you need to rethink your planning if you want to if you want to really start improving. Definitely, video reference can be a lot stronger for most people. Okay, pencil tests now. <clears throat> The thing with pencil tests is what I what I like to do if I do anything in in motion with with drawn thumbnails is I like it to be a little bit more useful down the road than just having done one 2D version of of the scene before I get started in 3D. I, I feel like that's a little bit of a waste of energy. I'm not a 2D animator, also by any stretch of the imagination, um, and I'm not the best draftsman. But I don't, but I don't just discount drawing. Okay, so we'll talk about this um, just a little bit uh, in just a little bit, and then acting out. Now, acting out is just you know video reference with without the camera around. But this, but what I'd like. To, to encourage you to do. I know it's embarrassing and it's no, you know, no one likes to do this stuff in front of their friends and family and whatever, but if you can get a little bit of feedback, I would say that your, your acting out of the scene would be so much stronger. The best video reference I see is when um, animators get their girlfriend or their husband or whatever, and they sit down and they have a character to play off of. And come on, that makes sense. You know that that's going to be a stronger performance. Now, I said I was going to talk about thumbnails. Um, these are some of uh, Victor Navone's thumbs that he has available on his website. And what I first want to emphasize is that you don't have to be a fantastic artist. Um, I, I will talk about drawing in, in, in just a, a few minutes, but there's some things that are important to as a baseline for thumbnails. Um, as you'll see, they're extremely simple. So it's, it really is a shorthand, a visual shorthand. You'll see that they are on model, that generally the entire proportion overall head to toe of, of this is Wally is is right there, it's right on. Now when they first started the Animation Mentor newsletter, the first article I wrote was uh, like 10 things you should do once you arrive at a studio, like your first day. What should you do? And one of my tips was you should bring a sketchbook because there's going to be a lot of sitting around for the first you know, few days, especially on, on a feature film. There's a lot of sitting around. You might be testing rigs, but maybe not. So bring a sketchbook, f figure out what characters you're going to be working with, and start learning how to um, thumbnail them quickly and accurately. Accurately is more important than quickly but quickly is also very important. Now you can see from these thumbnails like everything that is going on. There's so much expression in just these super simple drawings. Here he's like completely just devastated that his track fell off. He's like ultra tired he's so far. He's like leaning over and his like eyes are closing cuz he's about to about to fall asleep. Here he looks like he's stretching, like he's about to, about to run or something like that. Really downtrodden. I have a few more here. <coughs> uh, here's some human characters. Now these look like they were thumbed somewhere around the time when Ratatouille was being created. They have kind of the skinny oval shaped heads and the, the big noses. But each one tells a story. And look how many times he tried out the dynamic okay, of the man holding the, the, the woman up from falling. Here's one where he's kind of behind her and supporting her on the, on the back and the wrist. Here's one where she is more kind of like holding his hand. But I bet you he didn't like this one because she looked really old. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Then. I don't know what order he drew these in, but here's another one. Just looks like a mirror of that. Maybe this was the first attempt. Then there's this one where 
I think it's the opposite in this one. This one, she looks young. She looks too young to me because he's holding both of her hands and, and she doesn't have any use of her hands. So I'm not sure about this one. This one is so successful for me. Now, granted, this is a, a different relationship than this one is up here, but this one kind of this sums it all up. This one is definitely the pose in the, in the dynamic that I would choose, certainly for the end of the scene when they've, you know, they realize that, oh, you know, boy meets girl and then they fall in love on the roller skating ring. But, you know, kind of the holding hand, her leaning on him, the hand on the back, almost looks like dancing. But it is a very supportive kind of dance as well. She's looking up at him, her... Uh, uh, he down at her, um, so just like just like the the story that is told by these thumbnails, and I'm not talking about the story of the film or the story of the scene, the story of Victor's workflow. If you can't if you can't see how a workflow was executed and walked through on these thumbnails, uh, then that's one of the, the the areas that you need to start thinking about. Look how, much, look how much is going on. Look how powerful the process of exploring is. Where we started with like no connection, too old, too young, and then something, something really sweet, really nice right here. And it was the simplest choice. You know, he tried to have him hold her wrist, and she's leaning, oh, that's too much. You know, she's off balance, she's trying these different things. Uh, that didn't work. He didn't even render this uh, out completely. It looks like he abandoned it pretty quickly. And then there's one erase line right here. So it looks like, uh, I'll bet you he, w he felt this one was the most successful as well. But this is kind of just a visual representation of the kind of experimentation that you need to make your workflow um, improve every single time you, you run it through the, the machine. And I do kind of mean that. I do think that you have a, a kind of like a, a, a ringer, like a, a, a hand crank. And that, you know, you, you put a shot into it and you crank the machine and a shot comes out. And that shot is going to come out as good as the machine is put together. <clears throat> If you don't know anything about the machine, I don't know anything about my car. My car breaks down, I have to take it to a mechanic. Right? But if you know, if you know how your machine is going to, to work, then you have predictable results and you're in great shape. Back to Wally here. These are all the thumbnails. If you remember, this is just conjecture, by the way. I'm not, I'm not certain about this. Um, I haven't talked to Victor about this. But um, these thumbnails have a whole lot of exploration going on in there. I think this was, Pixar does, uh, does a good job of releasing teaser material for their films, not necessarily anything that will go in the film, but with Wally, -E, he, he was playing with, um, one of the gags of Wally -E is that he's like on the planet alone, and so he always comes across little bits of junk and stuff that he finds amazing and stuff. So one of them was a um, fire extinguisher, I remember, and it's just Wally -E on a white background with the extinguisher, and the other one was a vacuum cleaner. And so just look at all this exploration again. You know, he basically has Wally -E stick it in, in different places, and uh, it's just hilarious. I, I love this one. He's like, what the, uh, uh, you know, he's such a, he's like astounded by what just happened. Um, I love this one where it's stuck to his hand, and he's like, uh, uh. Um, This one, whoop, right in the crotch. He's like, Ehh. so much expression, cleaning the armpits. Opening the door, and he's like, oh, I love, love, love that one. Um, and But look how few lines, especially this one. Look when this one down here. There's literally like less than, if you don't count the shading on the hose or the neck, there's literally maybe 20 lines on this one. So if by now if you haven't uh, realized, I'm a huge, huge fan of thumbnails, not just for what they are, 
not just for okay well it's a basically in a little small little you know size of your thumbnail um, image of the pose you want to get that yes they have that utility but it's also about exploration and I do feel that exploration is a very sorely missing part of many 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 animators workflows okay so the thing with the thing with drawing is that times have changed since the birth of CG and I do believe that drawing skills are important again now this may be bad news to um, a few of you who don't like to draw but what I was always told was that you draw as well as whenever you stopped. So if the last thing you did was, the you know stick figures in in third grade when you had to take art class with the the crazy teacher with the guitar, then yeah, that's how you're going to be drawing now. It's just stick figures that look like they can be done by a third grader. Um, I went to I didn't go to animation school. I actually went to illustration at uh, Long Beach State, and. Um, it's because I was rejected from CalArts because they said I couldn't draw. And they were right. I thought my life was over because I said, oh my gosh, the only place in the world I want to learn animation is CalArts. It's the Disney school. I'm never going to be an animator now. I was so downtrodden. But they were right. And lo and behold, I met some incredible teachers who told me some, some really good things. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard this before, but one of them said that you have 10,000 bad drawings in you. They're basically just all stacked up. It's like a pile this high. You know, it's like a ream. And those are just inside. And all you have to do to, to draw well is you just have to get those, take those bad drawings out. So the only way to do it is just take out a piece of paper, get that bad drawing out, and just get it out of the way. He had a really nice way of, of, of visually illustrating this and communicating this. I'm not doing it as well as he did. I'm not doing it justice. But um, it, it really is that simple. Now that is what I was talking about earlier, which is the passive process. So if you're not looking to really actively improve your workflow, you will become a stronger animator if you literally take out a piece of paper and draw 10 thumbnails every single day. You will improve and it'll be almost no fault of your own. I mean, good for you for sticking to it and doing th and thumbnailing every day, but, um, but really you don't even have to think about it. You don't have to say like, oh, what am I doing right now for my workflow? So, and, and here's why. Um, I, I, when I went up to ILM, I was an uh, animation apprentice, and this was uh, before school, but it was during the time, it was, it was so early on in CG that they still had this program where they would take the top CalArts grads and they would give them six weeks and pay them to quote unquote learn the computer. And they would be like, hey, you're an animator. If you can learn the computer, you have a job. So that's how early on this was. And what ILM realized was that these animators from CalArts could all draw and could all communicate visually. And so it shouldn't be, the computer should be the, the, the missing part. It shouldn't be the other way around. Things have changed. Nowadays, everyone is expected to know the software and know everything back to front, at least as it pertains to your job. Um, and a lot of animators can't even draw a stick figure. But I think the pendulum is swinging back and it's going to swing back very quickly because the animation industry is being saturated. It's, there's a huge amount of talent out there, a very, very big talent pool. And the, the fact of the matter is, is in order to compete, what are you going to add to your um, bag of tricks? Are you going to add a little bit more software knowledge or are you going to add something that will always translate, will always be a form of communication that you can use and, and be a huge asset to your workflow? Uh, you decide. So not only just visual communication uh, is what I, I, I said just a second ago, and not only just planning and not only just for the efficiency that it adds 
to your, your scenes when you have the entire thing thumbnailed. But also getting shots. And this might seem like the pettiest reason to, to, to learn how to draw, but I have literally seen a animator in dailies or like in a sequence kickoff meeting. Sometimes what you'll do is you'll sit in a, uh, in a meeting and you'll see the previs or, or maybe the storyboard, the animatic of a sequence and it be, because you are going to be on that um, sequence. That's why they're showing it to you. I forgot to turn my phone off. Sorry about that. Um, oh, and by the way, I'm recording it with the... I hope this uh, sounds better. I did a couple tests and it did sound better to me. So I, I, I definitely hope it sounds better um, to you guys uh, with this new audio. I'm doing this because um, I recorded it and I'm still recording it with this little pack right here. With this little mic down there. Um, but. The way my camera works, it records it to a hard drive and it cuts it up every two gigabytes. And there's like a one or two second just little break. And it takes forever to line the audio up. So I hope this is better. So that's why I have this right now. We're, we're trying this one out. Um, so you'll be in a sequence kickoff meeting. And I, I, I've seen this. At enough times that I know that it's not like it's not a, uh, a a wild freak accident. But I've seen animators who really thumbnail well, who know what they're doing and know how to really communicate visually with thumbnails. Thumbnail in the back of the room while the sequence is is playing and whatever, and then right at the end of the meeting, go up to their lead or go up to their supervisor and say, hey. Hey, I, I I love that sequence. This is what you know. This is what I was just thinking. I, it gave me I, this idea for the you know for that that jump out the window or for you know when he grabs her hand and and tells her he loves her or whatever the scene is. And lo and behold, you know, a day later or whenever that sequence gets you know cut up by editorial and handed out to the animators, guess who gets that shot? The, uh, the animator that was proactive. Now it's no, you're, you're not a jerk for doing that. You're not a, a, a you know, this snidely shot stealer for doing that. It's, it's whoever wants to do the most work. Do you want to just take the shots that are given to you and do a great job on them and, and, and improve that way and, and contribute to the, to the team and to the film that way? Okay, that's fine. Someone who goes above and beyond is going to, to get the work. Okay, so um, I wanted just to show you real quick. Let's hope this goes a little bit better than it did last week in terms of switching um, stuff. Oh, I brought this book. This book is called Force Dynamic Life Drawing for Animators. So if you are interested in getting those 10,000 bad drawings out of you as fast as possible, uh, this will speed that, that process. So will Bridgman's life drawings, but Bridgman's is a little thick. This one is drawn, you know, created for animators, and it's, it's just fantastic. I can't plug this, this book enough. Oh, just looking at these poses, they're unbelievable. Unbelievable, and it'll teach you all about the full body gestures that I talk about um, in, in other lectures. We'll get to that kind of stuff. So force, dynamic life drawing for animators. Okay. Um, okay. So I wanted to show you, I said that what I prefer is for, um, my thumbnails to kind of live a little bit longer, or if I'm going to do anything that resembles a pencil test, that I like it to live a little bit longer into the life of my scene. Go away. Um, <clears throat> so this is what um, I like to do. I was asked by Brett Bennett, three or four years ago at AM um, for some help on his um, scene where he had a character um, jumping up in the air and then banging a rock on the ground. And it was a fantastic um, 
time for me to test out this workflow. And this is this is super, super easy. Anyone can do this. This is a program called Plastic Animation Paper. You can get it at plasticanimationpaper.dk. D as in donkey, K as in Kong. <laughs> um, and it's super simple to use. Uh, they just released the uh, pro version for free. It's fully, it's, it's like a full suite pencil test software. Um, I would not s uh, suggest using it to to make an entire film, um, but certainly something like the um, 11 Second Club you could do using uh, using a plastic animation paper. So my let's say the shot is a character you know landing and then immediately jumping. What I like to do is is try out just a couple very gestural uh, drawings and then export them and then you can actually use those in Maya. So uh, because it's more, more important to be accurate than it is to be fast with uh, your thumbnails, I'm just going to uh, open up the rig and just look over the proportions uh, really quickly just one more time. You always want to keep uh, you always want to stay on model. Okay, so we basically have this very square character. Um, he, he fits almost perfectly in a box. And uh, he's got almost no neck, wide head, high eyes, long nose. So if, this is, if, the, if you have access to the rig when you sit down for your first day on, on the job, I would just, I would literally open it up and don't pose it and then copy the pose with, with the drawing. Look at the character, look at his proportions, and then fill a sketchbook with him in all different poses. Um, the aspect ratio is wrong on my monitor. It's actually a little stretched. So I wonder how that's going to. <laughs> we might get a skinnier version of the of the model up here. So uh, so let's say my um, my scene, sorry, is the um, again character landing on the ground and then immediately jumping, jumping away. Let's just make this kind of thick. Okay. Now I'm I'm on frame one. Which is which is whatever. It's all good. So I want him to really have this like line, um, line coming down. So and I want him to be very kind of stretched out. But I want his arms in the air. So have his head and let's have like one arm up like this. And the other one kind of up like this. And maybe one knee. And just really stretching out before he lands. Something like that. Why is my almost thing so dark? I want to be dark. Oh, there we go. Just got to press hard. Okay, so let's, oops. Let's undo is, oh, undo is your friend, my, my friends. Undo is, is the best friend you'll ever have. There we go. That's the one I wanted. All right, so very, very, very loose thumbnail. Not a, uh, not an issue really of the um, getting the, if you want to call it the um, framing or any really directorial choice, it's more about, you know, I, I have my line, you know, going through here and I, I really want it to be dynamic, so I'm, I'm making the choice to make it um, a little bit looser so that I can keep that gestural quality. And so what you do is just drag down like this, oops. You can just select this one and then you go over here to blanket. 
see here. Um, I think that blanks it. Let's see. Yep. Um, and then spacebar turns on and off your light box, which is very, very helpful. Having a uh, little light box. Oops. You can erase as well if you have a Wacom or a Wacom. Never know how to pronounce this. Okay, so he just landed, so I really want this bent over kind of feeling. So, you know, get his head going, one hand down maybe. You know, very, very crunched up. Um, the other hand is going to be occluded, so I don't want to. I don't want to really make my thumbnail too um, um, too detailed because you'll lose that that kind of like that gestural um, quality to it. And then I'm just going to add one more, add one blank, and so you can see a space bar gives me my thumb, my uh, my not my thumbnails, my. Um, my light box again, and then and then the jump. So I, I I want this big you know burst upwards like this. So you know let's make it sort of like a superhero's you know exit to the scene. So you've got the got the fist backwards, the other fist up here. And let's make it the um, opposite knee as before is now up. And just very stretched out like that. Okay, so I have these. I have these three thumbnails, and so these are these are uh, can be very useful to me later on down the road. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to save it. And let's save it to my directory. Jump poses. And I'm just going to call this jump. And I'm going to hit, um, I'm going to hit JPEG, JPG. And it numbers them by, you know, you can have a couple different fra uh, frames of padding. When you do that, you got to be careful because it, it deletes the the name that you just put in. So I'm going to call I'm going to call this jump. And then what you do is you hit dot jump dot because Maya needs a a period before the numbering. Then you hit save. Okay. So now I have jump dot zero 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 one zero 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 two zero 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 three. So what I like to do is to create a new camera. And then look through this camera, and then add an image plane. If you go import image to your image plane, navigate to wherever you just exported that, <coughs> um, and then select the first one. In your attribute editor, hit Contr you Control A to get to your attribute editor. You can speed up your scene by making it just RGB, by the way, um, instead of RGBA. Okay. Um, I like it to be just a little translucent, so I'll turn it to like 0.4 or 0.5. And then you click on Use Image Sequence, but what you do is you click on Image Number and cl click Delete Expression, and then put a number one back into the image number. Okay. Now what I like to do is, let's make this a perspective window. Okay. In my perspective view, what I like to do is I like to create a curve that can hold this um, attribute that I want to make. So here's my here's my silly curve. Okay. Here's my new curve, and I'm just going to parent it um, to bloke's waist. And on here, this may seem like a little bit of a roundabout way, but if you set this up once, then um, it's actually it's actually pretty cool. So I'm going to lock and hide these. 
go to channels or sorry edit and add attribute and then call this like thumbnail okay make it an integer data type make the minimum one and the maximum let's say you have a hundred different thumbnails make it a hundred doesn't matter and then the default is one okay one last step is you go to the window general editors connection editor and it'll automatically load what you have selected which is that curve on the left okay no big deal and then you want to select your new camera wherever it is here it is okay go over to the image plane and then hit select and then hit reload right so you have your nerd circle on your left your image plane on your right and then what you do is you just go down here and connect thumbnail to image offset or frame offset um, oh, I'm sorry frame extension not frame offset frame offset makes it so that if it says image number one your frame offset adds to that number so sorry frame extension my bad okay cool so now and also I like it to only be seen um, through the camera that we're we're looking through so instead of um, look uh, instead of in all views um, just looking through camera okay so then you have this new camera okay that has your thumbnails attached to it and you don't have to go into the image plane or the attribute editor to change the number you have a control in the screen that um, that controls that so you can do all of your work in your channel box like you normally would so if I want to pose bloke now I have all my translates and rotates and everything looks good and is how I like to work but I can also at any time grab this and then change the thumbnail see that so that's pretty cool oops Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, um, that's not the fun one, let's copy the fun pose. One thing that is good to do is to match the, the camera res gate. How do I get that? Stand by. I just can't see with this thing so small oops no camera sorry about this I'm not sure if you can see this but my attribute editor is small as heck oh maybe I can just rip this off oh there we go oh that's so much better okay what am I looking for um, there I have a little bit more room So now what I can just do is pose my character the way that um, way that I have him in, in my thumbnail. Bend in the spine, counter animate against that, or counter pose against that. He's looking up. You guys get the picture. So, um, obviously, there's a lot, lot of work to go, but um, what I like about 
which is what I like about this workflow is I get to use my thumbnails um, kind of deep into the scene. One thing you can do is to make sure that you get kind of um, everything you're, you're, you're looking for is you can actually key this frame extension right here and then if you go into the graph editor you can just make sure that these keys are all stepped and then if you go forward to frame 12 or whatever and you want a different thumbnail like oops oops up uh, There we go. Then um, there you go. So you can you can you can dial in whichever thumbnail you feel is necessary. I hope that's not too light for the screen. I hope that that you guys can see that. Um, I don't know. We're gonna move on. Moving on up. Okay. So. Um, I wanted to move on to the fundamentals. So we start. We started talking about planning. I talked about how the um, video reference uh, can be dangerous. How to get more out of that. I talked about how to make um, make um, more um, uh, get a little bit more mileage out of your workflow already, um, just by tr practicing drawing. Um, I know it seems like a kind of like a cheap trick, but I mean, really, there's there's so much to be done in terms of your um, just in terms of your awareness and how much and how you're working and how you're improving every single day. Seems like my source is not working now. There we go. Sorry about that. Looks like we are a little stretched. Stand by. Okay, sorry about that. I hope that doesn't happen every single time. So um, we talked about all those things. Now let's go through the fundamentals. Do you guys know what the fundamentals are? And you've heard the fundamentals. But um, there's a point to be made about the order you learn these in. It just so happens that they are in a pretty darn good order, but not the best order. And there's, there's no reason that this shouldn't be revisited once you know kind of what you're doing. Okay, so, so my point right now is, for instance, when you started with your fundamentals, you probably, probably had bouncing ball, probably, and the first thing you tr played with was squash and stretch. Now that, that's a good choice because squash and stretch is very intuitive. Especially when you're talking about a bouncing ball. Um, I don't know very many people who should be animators that don't know that a uh, you know how squash and stretch should work with a bouncing ball, right? It squashes when it hits the ground, stretches, you know, as it shoots into the air. But it kind of is intuitive, right? So it makes for a good first fundamental to learn. Then you get on to anticipation. You want the ball to all of a sudden start looking like it's thinking. And I repeat this all the time because I think it's I think it's the gospel truth. Anticipation is thought. Eric Goldberg says that. I'm not sure where he got it, but probably from someone pretty important. Um, so then you have your ball like squishing before it shoots out. Okay, granted, I'll give it to you. Staging, straight ahead action, pose to pose, follow through and overlap. You know, the overlap is, you know, like a pendulum swinging or you get a tail on that ball, whatever it is. You don't jump around too much. And what actually ends up happening is the order that you learned these fundamentals in is kind of the order that you 
are going to apply them, or in other words, the order that they are, they've been applied to your workflow more than your work. Remember, I'm a, I'm a huge um, stickler on workflow, and, and what I'm trying to get at is it's almost as if it's the path of least resistance. Humans are creatures of habit, and when we have something to do over and over and over again, we will kind of take the path of least resistance. So these, so the, the fundamentals kind of become band-aids or patches on your, your first workflow that only had to take one fundamental into consideration. Now it's way too much to think about to tell a student right off the bat, all right, here's a flower sack. I want it, I want, you know, it, it em emotional. I want it moving with amazing physics and mechanics. I want it squashing and stretching. I want it overlapping. I want it follow throughing. I want it, you know, solid drawing, exaggerating. I want all this stuff on this flower sack. It'd be way too much, but if you think about it, the core of your learning process probably is a ball that squashes and stretches. Now that's okay because that does apply to a lot of things. You were most likely shown with your first walk cycle that there is kind of that bouncing ball in the hips and that that, that mechanic that you were taught um, is, is very applicable to a, a wide variety of animation situations. But again, you can't skip the fact that you were a different animator when you started than you are today. Unless you started yesterday, then you're the same. <laughs> so, um, squash and stretch. I'm not saying this is like a bad fundamental or anything. But what I'm saying is, it's time to rethink how you apply these fundamentals as you're working and not just put them in the order that you learn them. Now these are the fundamentals that are kind of the ones that you work with. Um, the ones that I took away are sort of inherent. They're sort of, you know, just, well, I mean, you can't get away without staging. All right, and I, I'm saying this for a reason. I'm not downplaying staging. Staging is, is vitally important to your scene. But assuming that you have your scene staged and it's time to actually create keys, then these are the ones that you're looking at in terms of how the, they, they went together and were ordered. And what I'd like to propose is that there is a way to think about um, these fundamentals as you're working to uh, make it so that your work is a lot more note proof and a lot easier to change. And it's called implementing the fundamentals um, at the beginning. Okay, Everything you do with your scene will somehow propagate through to the end of the, the shot. My the number one problem I have when I'm in the class six portfolio at Animation Mentor is students come in with work that has been that has been polished but it was never meant to be. So they polish it way too soon and um, and then they're paying now they're paying for it. So everything you do will somehow live to the end of the scene. If you have a 500 frame shot, that's a monster. I would never do that. But if you had a 500 frame shot and on frame 150 you've deleted it, you know, 10 times, and you had some big ideas and some small, and you just can't figure it out. Someone will be able, with a trained eye will be able to look at that shot and around 150 just see a little hiccup, a little waver, something going on there that you know shows that you were working there. So everything kind of just lives on. There's always an artifact of what you're doing. So if you can add your fundamentals at blocking, you're not going to have to make raw movement work with um, the building blocks that actually create performance. Okay, so, um, and again, with so much going on in a scene by the end, you can, you can make sure that you don't have to remember um, to, to, to put great fundamentals in if you started with them. 
Okay, and then this last point, spicing up fundamentals doesn't change the scene much. Um, that's a little tangential to what we're talking about, but we have an opportunity when we start a scene each time to like open a brand new door and turn over a new leaf in terms of our workflow. And so uh, I just like to propose this method of, of thinking of a scene. Okay. Falling back on the fundamentals. Let me let me show you something. Okay, so it's much easier to imagine a single fundamental adjusted than an entire scene. Okay, so let's all do a let's do a little experiment together. In the cartoony workflow, I had us all squint our eyes and look at um, some images, and um, it's a lot of fun. And I like doing this one as well, so I'm going to do it with you. Okay, so let's all actually close our eyes. Okay, you don't have to worry. I'm not showing uh, some secret of animation on the board right now. Actually, I am. Look. Okay, I'm just kidding. All right, so let's all close our eyes, okay? And let's just imagine a bouncing ball, okay? You have your bouncing ball. It's a, it's a rubbery type ball, pretty squishy, but it's not losing any energy, so it's bouncing to the same height every single time, and you can pick the pace, okay? So I have one in my, my head right now that's bouncing like... And so just imagine that bouncing ball. It can be any color you want. It can be any size like in your mind that you want. But just imagine it bouncing over and over and over and over and over. Okay. Now, keep imagining it, keep imagining it, keep it bouncing, keep it bouncing. And now what I want you to do, keep it bouncing, is to imagine it with twice as much squash and stretch on it. Go. All right. Now, keep it, keep it super squash and stretchy. Very, very easy. It's very, very easy to imagine that fundamental change. All right, let's go back to the original bouncing ball. Keep it bouncing, keep it bouncing. Okay, now let's imagine it with twice as much slow in and slow out. Okay, so it's really hanging at the top of that arc. Okay, really, really plateau that arc on that bouncing ball. And the same timing, but it's just hanging up there as long as it possibly can, and then bam, coming down. Okay, now let's go back to the original bouncing ball. Okay. Okay, cool. Now let's open our eyes. Now, what, what does that illustrate? Um, anyone anyone that has any exposure to animation can really do that exercise. And what's interesting is if we we can keep that image in our head. We can keep the ball bouncing and we can keep that, you know, we can play with the um, squash and stretch. And we can play with the slow in and slow out. We can play with those things in real time and keep that, that, that ball bouncing. But if all of a sudden I said to you, okay, there's a ball bouncing, there's a ball bouncing, okay, now make that ball happier. I guarantee you, Instantly, you'd lose, like you drop the ball. The ball would go away for a second, then you bring it back, and then you start thinking about it, and then you try to make it bounce. But you would not be able to make it bounce immediately and instantly. Okay. So this is kind of a neat trick because if you can imagine a single fundamental adjusted in your scene, then well, you have all the tools you need right there. If you can use fundamental adjustments as your first tool to hit notes and adjust work, then you are doing something that you can do in your head um, instantly. So I knew a guy at um, Weta that had this workflow that I don't know how he survives. He, he has to be the hardest worker I know, and bless him, he doesn't have to be at all. He's super talented, but every single note he got I saw him pretty much restart his whole scene. If you are twice as fast an animator as anybody else, that'll work for you, but you don't have to be. So this is the, this is the tool that I like to use to adjust work. You can am avoid making performance choices by using this. And that's not really true. It's not you're not avoiding a performance choice. You're doing it smarter and, and not working harder. You can avoid reblocking <clears throat> uh, 
And now let's see here. I think it's time for the demo. Stand by. Okay. One more slide. Sorry. Okay. So a character's performance stems from an assemblage of animation fundamentals. I uh, said that word in Montreal when I was giving this lecture and uh, I was laughed at as I deserved to be. <clears throat> Low level adjustments can have great impact on performance. So these two, these two points. A character's performance is basically a combination of animation fundamentals. What are you doing when you're having that character, you know, take a breath before he walks? He's anticipating. When he lands on, when his foot hits the ground and he, you know, his whole body kind of, you know, compresses that squash and stretch. When his arms swing, you know, just a little bit behind each step that he takes, there you have your overlap. So if everything is basically a combination of these fundamentals and any low-level adjustment can really impact your performance, then you have the, the only tool you ever need right there. Certainly for an advanced workflow to start thinking about. Start learning not only to tell which fundamentals impact your performance later, but plan them. And then most importantly, knobs. Knobs. Knobs! I'm sorry if the microphone clipped on that, uh, that little outburst. Yes, knobs. Exhibit B. Okay. Exhibit umlaut. All right. So let me open this scene and I'll show you what I'm talking about. We have a character, and guess what? Poor guy just found out that he lost his job. Okay? And he's very, as you can see, very upset about that. Now, when you create a walk cycle, for instance, what are you really doing? Again, if you, if that character takes a breath before he goes, he just made the anticipation. Each time he steps in, you have the compression in the spine and the waist and the hips. Then you have that squash and stretch. You have the, the wrists, just a little bit of, of rotation after that movement kind of resolves. So there you have your overlap. So a, excuse me, a walk cycle clearly an assemblage, if you will, of animation fundamentals put together in a, in a way that creates the illusion of life. You have it right here. This definitely looks like a guy walking home that just learned that he, you know, lost his job. Very upset. Okay? Now, When you start thinking about, let's think about one channel. Let's think about rotate X, okay? Which is, if you're staring down the Z axis, rotate X is right at you, right? Let's think about rotate X in the spine, okay? So this motion, right? This is rotate X. Now what is rotate X doing in this character? In this character, Rotate X is controlling basically overlap in the spine. And what, and here's the big point, what is overlap in the spine controlling in this scene in terms of the performance? I would go so far as to say that Rotate X is controlling the sadness. It's almost like... It's almost like Rotate X is the, the sadness button. So let's say you, you showed this off in dailies and the director said, you know what, he just doesn't look sad enough. Can you make him a little sadder? Because um, we changed the script. He didn't just lose his, his job. He, he lost his job and his wife left him because of it. You're like, okay, well, whatever the reason. <laughs> so let's open up the graph editor, and let's take a look 
at the rotate X in this guy's spine and it's probably doing I'm just going to show selected types what you thought it was going to. Look at it right there. That's probably what you thought it was it was going to do. Can I change that color? Huh. I can't change the graph editor background? That seems silly. Huh. Is that any better? Let's make it bright yellow. There we go. Okay, there, now you can see it. So now you have what you probably thought it was doing. He's taking a step and his spine is, is overlapping. So this is probably, anyone with any animation you know, exposure could identify this as you know, basically a cycle on that. So if I get the note, let's make them sadder, what do I, what do I want to do? I want to increase the overlap as my first line of defense, my first attempt to, to hit notes. And you'll be surprised how effective this can be. So, and doing it smartly. We don't want to, we don't want to kind of haphazardly work, right? So let's just grab the curves. What I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to scale them up because that will increase the amount. Okay, that increased it. And overall, I want him leaning over more, just in general. So I'm scaling them up and I'm moving them up. And now one thing I need to do is because his arms were not um, his arms are FK. I need to just show all. I need to just reposition his arms, make sure they're in the right spot. There we go. Okay, so now this needs a little bit of work. And I understand that, but whereas my poor friend would basically reblock what we have is a way that is a, how long did that take? Five seconds? And you can do that in your head. You can close your eyes and say to yourself, what fundamental is making this, this performance choice really happen? And then when you imagine it, then you just execute it. So when you, so when you are working, my, my advice and my, my workflow um, challenge to you guys is that when you're working is to learn not only how to tell which fundamentals are going to make these, these performance choices come to life for you, but, to, but plan them, okay? And know that when you look at your... When you're, when you're looking at your animation come together, okay, and you look at the spine of your character, well, when you're doing this, and then the curves start looking, I mean, how you could predict that they would look, when they start looking like that, think of that the way that I do, and think of that as a knob, okay? Think of that as a knob. Every single control basically is a choice, and the, the, the value that you set that control at is going to create motion, but that motion is based on a fundamental you learned, and that fundamental is what pieced together creates the performance. So here I have what is this on a um, on a on a character that's sad and walking? Uh, maybe squash and stretch. Squash and stretch is normally like a lot of bounce in a walk. 
So that's going to make them look a little bit more happy, isn't it? So I want my squash and stretch turned all the way down. Don't I? But this, this is overlap. I want that cranked all the way up. This is the slow in, slow out. This is overlap. I'm oh, sorry, no, I already said that that was overlap. This is, um, whatever, uh, any other fundamental you want to you wanna pick, exaggeration, arc, staging, follow through, anything. And so what you start being able to do, and any, any animator in the industry will be able to tell you that they can tell their shot that, that really killed them, they can tell them years later by the, the graph editor. Because um, it's, it's just so that apparent. When you start working on a shot and you see your, the rotate X on your spine start looking like that, that's a good indication that you have controls that you can dial in, okay? High level notes, like, yeah, make them think about it longer. Well, anticipation is thought. Longer anticipation and then he goes. Instead of just, and then go, if he really leans over and anticipates and then goes, then obviously he thought about it. Now that is not, it's not a uh, panacea of, of, of animation notes. It's a great way though to have a first line of defense so that you're not derailed by any note that comes your way. Okay? Um, that's kind of the point here. So in terms of note proofing your work, high loving, high level, high loving, Come on, <laughs> that's a pretty sweet Freudian slip. Oh, you want to hear a funny one? Uh, my uh, my mother, she was at my house, and um, she had she was dropping my father off at the airport, and she was going home, and um, it was really late at night, and she goes, um, 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 she goes, oh, oh, it's time for me to. Uh, uh, go to bed, uh, go home. And I'm like, Mom, come on. And, you know, she totally slipped up. And I'm like, Mom, come on, you're obviously too, sl too tired. And she goes, no, 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 that was just a Freudian sleep. <laughs> it was totally, it was totally honest. Uh, uh, Mom, Mom, it was, it was great. We all enjoyed it. So, hi, loving. Uh, or performance notes can be devastating to near finished work. You know this, your mentors, if you're at Animation Mentor, or your supervisors, if you're working, um, sometimes come back with their own notes or client notes that really f seem devastating. So if you keep your work simple and editable and using a fundamental approach, you won't have any problems. I'll give you another example. Um, work was kind of slow here. Um, uh, two weeks ago, so um, I got a call from Entity FX to do a couple of shots on Vampire Diaries, so I went and did it. It was about four days of work, whatever. I had uh, five shots to do, and it was animating a wolf in an episode of Vampire Diaries, and it's all very, very, very quick. But it was, all, it was a lot of coverage. So what that means is that there was like a camera here and it jumps out of the truck and then there's a camera here and it's like in air and then it's like a camera down at the guy and it lands on the guy and then it's a camera the other way and then and it watches it um, run off. Um, doesn't look anything like what I animated because they cut it and they speed it up and, and whatever. But this is what I did. I The first, first thing I did was I animated, the whole sequence was, was supposed to be about six seconds long. I animated the whole sequence because I knew they were going to cut it up. And then um, the owner came in and he looked at the work and he said, well, that's really good. You can keep going. We don't, we don't quite have the, the cut yet. We don't have the cameras for you. Um, don't tell him this, but I didn't do anything. I just waited because I had, I had all my keys were perfectly laid out. I had like eight to 12 really, really good, like everything was like all keyed on the same frame, so it was super editable. It was almost like the uh, graph editor was a dope sheet. I could have used the dope sheet for once. No one uses the dope sheet in Maya. Um, uh, but I didn't do anything because I knew that if I kept it simple and editable, 
when it was time to split up the work and, and work on each shot individually, that I would be I would be much faster working with that really editable and simple um, keyframed uh, sequence. And lo and behold, I got all my cameras. I, I copy the animation into you know the five different Maya scene files, and then I started adding keyframes and doing a little bit of frame by framing and keying on ones and twos and a little you know a little you know a little detail on the tail and stuff like that. And and it turned out good. But. I knew that if I went forward and, and kept on working and inundating and polishing the scene that didn't need to be polished or shouldn't be polished, that I was going to create a lot more, um, or I was going to take away all my note proofing that I had done. Okay? Remember the knobs. You may have less work to do than you think. Okay? Now, that little anecdote. Um, was not to encourage you guys to not do work that your supervisor asks you to. Um, that was a um, kind of like an isolated insulin incident when I knew that um, I was going to be able to perform, and that comes from you know um, a dozen years of, of animating on the job. So. Um, just be careful with that. But definitely on your own work and when you're working on in, an entire shot, especially a performance shot, you want to get feedback on your work when it's still editable, when you still have all of your strong poses um, you know, keyed on the same frame and that kind of thing. Okay? And work your fundamentals into, into your shot. Um, um, I like to work at least you know, anticipation, overlap, a little bit of squash and stretch into all my poses. So it's not like I have a character here and then a character here and then a character here and whatever. I try, if there's a, going to be a little bit of squash and stretch, I know that I can um, kind of build it into each one of my poses so that I know, like without a doubt, those fundamentals are going to survive until the end of the scene. Be self-critical. Your eyes are only fresh for a few viewings of the same animation. So what I like to do is I like to um, um, be very aware of that fact. For instance, um, take advantage of whenever you have a, a, a long break from looking at your work, if you just got home from, uh, uh, not got home, if you just got to work in the morning, uh, if you just got back to work after lunch, anytime that you have longer than your normal amount of time looking at a shot, you need to take advantage of that, that fact that your eyes are fresh. And what I like to do is make a list, okay, anytime you have those fresh eyes. So when you sit down at a shot in the morning, make a list. I like to use notepad. I think uh, you can use whatever you want. You can use a, a pen and paper, like a real pen and paper if you want, um, and just write down the frame number and then what you see. Okay? And do this in the morning. Do this when you sit down after coming back from lunch. Excuse me. Uh, do this over and over and over again when you get when you know you have your fresh eyes. And the reason is, is because if you work on, let's say you have a a shot and you're working on it, you sit down in the, in the, in the morning and you, you see a big thing and it's obviously the first thing that you want to fix. You start working on that thing and then you play blasting and you're watching it over and over and over and over. You have lost by that time the ability to see some of the more subtle things that are in that shot just because you've been staring at it for so long. Whereas if you have a list that you've made, it was made when your eyes were still fresh. So it's almost like you're bringing your fresh eyes with you into the shot. So if you have a list, you are actually extending the amount of time that you um, have a, a critical eye on your own um, shot. Keyframe economy, quick tricks, rebuild. Rebuild keys is normally f for um, for like mocap or, or something that you had to um, key on ones. Um, frame and delete and buffer curves and letting tangents work for you. Let's um, do just a little quick example of what those um, three things are. Framing and deleting is very, very simple. All it is is if I have a problem on, let's say, frame 14, 
and I don't know why. There's no keys on frame 14. Why is that? Why is that? a bad frame. What I'll do is I'll go to frame 12, I'll key everything, you see it left the key, I'll go to maybe 16, so two frames of, uh, forward and back, and then I'll just delete everything in between. Okay? And so what that does is that kind of, it, it'll, you know that it'll take out if there's a little bit of like a hitch that you, you, you won't be able to figure out or find. Okay, obviously it looks like my tangent types are wrong for this kind of um, um, practice right here, or this kind of exercise right here, but I haven't set my preferences on this um, install of Maya, so uh, it's not a big deal. Um, but the point is, is that sometimes, you know, Kong had 250 controls in his face alone. You know, sometimes there'll just be something popping, like maybe you accidentally keyed something on stepped and you left it stepped. Maybe you, you know, slid a key and you slid it over on top of a new, another key. Something could be going wrong that you'll never find. So it's almost like creating bookends and, and um, you key everything on those bookends and then you, it's like a little kill box. You just kill everything in the middle and, um, and then redo it and redo it thoughtfully. One of the nice side effects of this is that you'll get a keyframe on the body that has all of your fundamentals and all of, uh, in a little bit more of your advanced concepts built in. So remember I was talking about when you're blocking, it's great if you can get something like overlap, you know, built into that pose as you're making it. Well, if you frame and delete, well, what's nice is if this is the key you framed it on, then it's a pose, it's a, it's a, it's a keyframe, it's a golden pose that has all of those other fundamentals built into it. Take a look at those keyframes when you use this trick of framing and deleting for how you could have built a little bit more of the fundamentals in and see how am I making um, my choices, what, what is my, my instinct um, creating and what is the reality of the situation, what is the end result looking like. Because if you keyed it like this and then by the end, you know, it's like, it's like this, well, it's like, hmm, why didn't I, why didn't I key it correctly? Well, why didn't I see that there was going to be a lot more, you know, a lot more follow through in this action or whatever it is? Why didn't I see that? And then buffer curves. Buffer curves are probably the most amazing tool, I think, in Maya. What a buffer curve is, is basically a permanent undo in, uh, in Maya. So if you see these two buttons right here, one of them is, is it makes a buffer curve by snapshotting the curve, and then this one swaps the buffer curve. So you have to go up to View Buffer Curves, okay? And then if you click this one, nothing happens. Well, actually, what it did is it left a little bit of a ghost frame. Oh, can you see that? Oh, you can't even see that. That's unbelievable. All right, I need to change the, the color. 3D views. Animation editors. Graph editor background. There we go. Unbelievable. All right. So as you can see right here, it left a little ghost behind. All right? And if I do that again, if I click that button again, it left the ghost behind right there. Why this is nice is because you can make a buffer curve on as many animation curves as you possibly want. Let me select all of these, buffer them all. Look, there they all are. Okay? As many as you want. And you can always click on this button, which will put the curves back on the old buffer and leave a, a new buffer behind where they are now. Boom. Okay? You see that? It will snaps them back to where they were. Okay? So let me show you that one more time. Here they are. I'm going to buffer them. I'm going to, oops, go select them all. All right, I'm gonna buffer them. I'm gonna move them way over here. Okay, it's like, oh no, I, I deselected it. No problem. Just boom, it sends them right back. Why is that great? Because if you're if you're experimenting, which you should be doing, I, I, I tell everyone, please experiment. You have a save as. You have um, you have undo. You can have as many uh, copies of your scene as you want. 
try new things. If you, if you are relying on undo, though, you're going to have to undo as many edits as you did to get to that point. And sometimes you'll run out of your undos, or if you go down one tree and you explore another, you'll you kind of cut off that undo tree. Okay, so this is a, and it's saved in the scene as well. How awesome is that, that it's saved in the scene? So at any time, you can go off, you can, you know, you can, you know, put this away, and then, you know, create a camera, you know, create a polygon, you know, scale it around, whatever, close the scene, open the scene, okay, which is crazy that you can do all of that, all right, and then go back to your animation editor, and there it is, there's that ghost, that ghosted curve, and then you can pop it right back, there it is, okay, so, um, buffer curves are extremely powerful. And then the last point that I um, made was let tangents work for you. Um, if you have, if you, if you can make a certain um, uh, shape with a tangent, okay, and not a key, then, then, then do that. All right, so if I want this to be nice and smooth, okay, then, then, then try to do that. So my point here would be, let's just take this one, this one wrote, okay. So if this, this is the result of me doing a frame and a delete, okay, that I have two keys right here. If I want it to look like this, and I want to have good keyframe economy, I'm gonna make a buffer curve of this one, okay? Delete this, and then as you can see, my buffer curve is left behind. So then I can just match this, match the um, curve um, as, as close as I possibly can. And sometimes what that will take is, um, you should always have weighted tangents anyway, I, I believe, um, but what that'll take is, um, what am I looking for? Did I weight these already? Free tangent weight, there we go. Just a little bit of finagling with the uh, tangent weights sometimes. To get it as close as possible. Chances are, chances are in most curves, the um, the the difference in the uh, shape, you know, difference in shape like this much. Can you, can you even see the buffer curve behind there? That difference won't make a difference. So um, you'll be okay. Um, another thing is that that I um, said was to create motion trails or some sort of arc tool um, as a visual aid for spacing. Now, the, you need to be a little bit careful when you're doing this, okay? Motion trails and arc tools. <clears throat> uh, how to use them. One of the, one of the um, things um, during polishing that is a huge pitfall for animators is the um, fact that when you're creating your animation, you have um, your controls that are, if you're posing your character IK, you have the, the, the waist and you have the arm IK, and you kind of like are, are posing the character like using these things and moving them around. And that creates an unnatural reliance on those controllers or an unnatural kind of connection in your mind to those controllers. And what I mean by that is when it's time to start looking at your arcs, all you're looking at is like your hips kind of and like your arms and, and, and really like your wrists and hands. Whereas everything creates arcs, okay? this. You know, my hand extending, my, my, the hand itself might be on a smooth arc, but if the elbow is moving like that on my hand's nice and smooth arc, 
well, that's not going to look very good at all. So you, I, I know you guys are looking out for elbows popping and elbows, you know, and knees popping and, and, and things like that. But really, until you start getting into talking about and looking at and planning force, then you're not going to be looking at um, the arcs that you need to. So I just want to... Um, um, re-emphasize that arcs are king and that you n really need to focus on how are the forces creating strong arcs in your work not just the extremities okay the arms and the and the, the hands and, and 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 the nose okay everything really needs to feel full body on arcs okay um, here's a neat trick Inner monologue as a timing tool. Good pantomime has distinct beats and phrases, and what you'll notice is that sometimes you have dialogue that, that kind of like animates itself. I find dialogue easier to animate because it has those rhythmic patterns, okay? So my trick is to create a line of dialogue that is the character's inner monologue for a tool to help you time your shot. So instead of your character arriving and you trying to think to yourself, well, how long is he going to stare at the box and think before he grabs the box? Make up a line of dialogue. So have him say, hmm, what's that? Is it someone else's? Maybe. I think I should... No. Wait. Yes, I will. So, obviously that is nothing that anyone would ever say out loud. But if you have that in your mind and you can use that over and over, you'll find that a lot of your monologue um, really times itself with this trick. Okay? So, um, it's not... Um, it's not actually um, that hard to time it when, it when it gets down to it. Use the implied phrasing to help you time the animation. I just said that. Um, if you want, you can even record it and put it on the timeline. Nothing says that if you're animating a monologue shot and you need a little bit of um, help um, timing it that you can't record your little inner monologue and, um, and put it on the timeline. And just like when he goes, I don't know. Just like time it, that up and down. I don't know. Just let it let it dictate your your timing choice because it's your performance choice, and that's fine. Um, you know the the uh, Disney masters they had a stopwatch and a, and an X sheet. You know they would they would you know think about something and they would look at their stopwatch and write it down and and you know it's not cheating. Only mocap is cheating. That normally gets a good laugh um, when I'm giving this. Um, Giving this talk, and uh, ooh, we are over time already. Holy mackerel. Journal your workflow. This is um, super important, but it's very simple, so I can kind of um, speed through it. Remember, most workflow problems are systemic. Oh, do you see that? Try new things, actually. They, they all come in from the left, and it's like, oh, try new things. I'm so clever. So, journal your workflow. What I like to do, say is, like, just have a piece of paper by your desk. Um, work in one hour increments. At the end of the hour, take five minutes and write down what you did, what you tried, and how well it worked. You, you will um, very quickly start to see a pattern emerge, and you'll be able to adjust your workflow or what you're trying to do new with your workflow very quickly and easily, and your workflow will improve so quickly if you journal your workflow. I know journaling is such a pain in the butt, and it's no fun, blah, blah, blah. It's, it, it pays dividends so quickly, um, there's really no, really no excuse not to at least give it a try. Um, um, if, if, only, if only for being able to try new things and have a record of when it went wrong. This is just like another level of, of workflow undo. Right? So you have scene undo in Maya, you have workflow undo if you journal it. These are just quick tips. Things to avoid, facial animation before the body is blocked. Your facial animation, your emotion pass can be blocked in um, as soon as maybe blocking plus on the body. Um, I would not get to lip sync any, anywhere before then. Um, someone on the... Uh, Someone on the forums uh, for 11 Second Club made a really good um, point, which was 
those facial cameras, which are always so crazy to look at. Like, I hate looking through a face cam. He's like, those facial cameras basically um, are misguided because a, you know, an O or whatever might not look like an O if the character is turned away from you. And so you'll work so hard in that face cam and then, like, once the character starts moving, it won't look right. And his point was, um, lip sync is more about what it looks like like in the moment more than any like distinct poses and I thought that was I thought that was brilliant lips before jaw I'm always jaw pass first um, I will do the lip sync lecture in which I'll talk about my my workflow it's it's very heavily based on Jason Osipa's method um, with a few tweaks of my own um, constraints of non-essential props. Don't bother with constraints um, in the beginning. You can just get so inundated and, and just be focusing on like what the prop is doing and not the character's performance. Performance is, is the most important thing. Unnecessary use of C-sets. Um, if, you if, you're, if you're just trying to key like four controls in a 200 control C-set, then you're going to have 196 controls that have keys all over them that you're just going to have to delete later. I think that's just a little bit of a waste. Counter animation. The sub point is thoroughly test your rigs. Um, you guys will see, um, uh, actually only if you're an animation mentor will you see um, uh, a lecture in which I, that, that I give um, in which um, not thoroughly testing the rig on the part of the student um, really set them back. Um, always know when you're, uh, you're testing rig. And finessing IKFK switches before your shot is done. If you, someone's jumping into the air and there's a little bit of pop in the legs, Get the animation, get the get the body mechanics done before you worry about like if the legs are jumping to their IK position, um, you know, uh, before anything. I, I I really don't like to see a whole bunch of FK IK finessing um, too early. A few more things to avoid: animating with a bad plate, camera, or track. It's not really workflow; it's common sense. Don't um, make sure that you have everything you need to start your scene, or you're going to be doing uh, work that needs to be undone. Play blasting. <laughs> Um, what was funny is I gave this um, this lecture at uh, CGCon in 09 and Dave Burgess was right after me and um, the first thing he said was play blast all the time, always be play blasting and so I was a little embarrassed but then he explained further and it turns out we have the same view on this. The problem with I don't like with play blasting is if your character your rig is so um, complex that you can't just hit play to see your animation at speed, then you're, you you need to get a slimmer um, character rig. You need to either ask your your um, supervisor or TD or something, or figure out a way to make your scene fast enough to be able to watch in real time by hiding, using display layers, or turning off some evaluating notes. Don't do the last one if you don't know what that is. But um, Dave Burgess's point and mine were the same, which is there's no replacement for watching your animation at speed. So always watch it at speed when you're when you're judging it. Okay. Um, this is kind of a um, an in-depth point. Um, I, I'm probably going to end up doing a lecture on texture alone. And um, so I'll just kind of like glance off of this as well. Um, these are basically the two main points. If your texture is central to the performance, plan on it. So like a large breath in the middle of dialogue, dialogue, a large breath in dialogue I call an anchor, which is something that kind of like makes it, sucks the audience in, really makes them feel like, you know, that character is in that scene and really breathing and really, really moving and, and all that stuff. A rattle in a character's voice, if they're scared or something, putting a little bit of that texture in the body, animation, etc. If it's not central to the performance, add it in as much as you can. I really believe that. I really think that you can't have as much non-performance texture as you, uh, uh, you know, there's never too much. So a character breathing naturally, you know, if uh, one character is watching another, just have them breathing just a little bit. It always, it, it always works and it never takes away. I really believe that. Secondary actions of different f frequency, like non-full body gestures, um, just picking secondary actions that kind of, you know, give a little bit, you know, if they're moving just like slowly left and right, listening or something like that, maybe they can be twiddling their thumbs or doing something that has a contrasting speed or timing or, or staging as their main full body action. And then, 
this is this is the brunt actually of that that texture lecture texture lecture I want to do, um, which is the more you can connect performance with secondary actions of different frequency and size, the better. So in my secondary animation. Um, lecture actually I do talk about connecting performance to secondary actions of different um, sizes and it really adds a lot so um, you should definitely check out that lecture if you haven't already um, one example for instance is rowing a boat and giving a, a shrug in the middle of a row um, and when I gave this um, talk in Montreal um, um, I really I really liked that example and so I harped on it but you know someone just rowing a boat and they don't know what you know they don't know what the answer is so right in the middle of the row they they give their shoulders a shrug like that level of of connecting performance to that secondary action and, and, and doing it in a textural way I think is I think is tops. It's my favorite. So let's put it all together. Remember drawings can be used far into the scene for posing as well as timing. Remember you can keyframe that attribute that you created and um, actually do a, a, a do a little bit of timing choice with your with your pencil test. Fundamentals are the building blocks of a scene. Keep access to them all times. All right. I didn't move on with my shot. Don't do as I as I do. Do as I say in terms of <laughs> doing your work. You know that was that was a risk I took, kind of, but it paid off. But remember to keep access to your fundamentals. They can be your fallback if so you get a performance change. So keeping your fundamentals in mind and using them as your first line of defense and, and closing eyes and imagining one fundamental at a time. What are those? What are those knobs? Okay. So think about performance in terms of fundamentals at the beginning. Obviously, that is how you're going to keep access to them um, uh, open for the whole time. Keeping keyframes sparse, using framing and delete, using buffer curves, letting tangents work for you. Be careful of your arcs as well, because your arcs are going to be. You, um, there's a huge um, bias towards like only looking at arcs on the extremities because that's what you're using to pose. But remember, uh, remember force. Get that book. It's a great book. Pantomime can be timed using inner monologue. If you are having trouble creating a performance and timing that performance using just you know your imagination and a stopwatch, then actually go into your head and talk through what you're doing. Is it to the left or maybe to the right? And use the timing and the inflection of your voice like that. Be like, hey, or is it maybe? That's your anticipation. You know, use those tricks and that, and that natural rhythm of the words in your mind to time your, your, your pantomime. You can even record it if you want to. Journal your workflow. Journaling your workflow is a way to in increase the speed of your workflow uh, maturity. It's also like journal, I mean, it's also like workflow undo. So anything that you do wrong, you have record of it and you can make that change. Avoid pitfalls like polishing too early and technical minutia. Also avoid losing your fresh eyes when you're when you're working and by making lists at the very beginning. Plan texture when it's central to performance and then add it when it can't be um, planned for. The final 5% with non-performance texture. Any little thing you can do, Sean Kelly likes to say, dirty the keys up a little bit. It's always really nice to feel that organic quality to the motion. Okay? And then have more fun. All right. <clears throat> That's it. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, please check out KennyRoy.com for more lectures and uh, for more news on what I'm going to be doing with these lectures in the future. Arconics.com is my studio. Thank you for listening, and as always, rock on.